Hi, my name is Lyle Murphy, the founder of the Alternative to Med Center, and today's video is going to be covering um, mercury poisoning causing your anxiety or depression. Um, and we're going to answer a few questions that our readers have and a couple we threw in to make it good. Um, first question, does mercury cause anxiety? So this is actually the reason why I was um, inspired to do this video. We've seen a very strong correlation between a mercury burden and anxiety. Um, the next question would be, what are the symptoms and signs of mercury poisoning? I want to make a small clarification here. Um, mercury poisoning is usually an acute phenomenon. In other words, like someone swallowed a thermometer, someone was in a place where mercury vapors uh, were in a chemical lab or something and had an acute situation, which that level of mercury would show up in their blood. That is not the type of population that we treat. <clears throat> um, we treat people who have had a burden that has occurred over a duration of time. <clears throat> so we call it a mercury burden. Um, to go a little bit more into that, um, how we acquire a mercury burden is we humans are not the greatest at being able to um, <clears throat> eliminate mercury. So if we take in mercury, um, it, the approximate half-life, depending on genetics, is one year on average for a person to clear half of that mercury back out of their system. For a fish, it's two years. Uh, that's why um, larger fish can be, can be quite toxic, um, at least as far as their levels of mercury. Um, one fillet of swordfish has been known to cause a, a, a fetal damage in pregnant mothers uh, during certain um, embryonic um, stages. Uh, but however, in a rat, a rat that lives in sewers has superior genetics and can clear its mercury in a day. So the mercury burden of a, of a rat is very low. Now, to give an example of what this might look like, if I'm giving you, let's say I'm giving you money, and I'm giving you $5, but you can only spend one in the same amount of time that I give you five, and then I start giving you $5 every second, you're going to build up a lot of money really fast. It's not going to be a straight line either. It's going to be a logarithmic curve of how much money you're accumulating versus or how much money you're taking in versus how much you're able to spend. So this is how a mercury burden can creep up on us. Generally, a mercury um, burden will present as a, a type of anxiety that had a bit of a slow build. In other words, it, it, it's, um, it's called insidious. It's just kind of snuck up on you. Now, there can be a, a snapping point. When in our life where we're having to move, uh, we had death of a loved one, we got fired from our job. I mean, there can be like a snapping point, but most of those people can trace back that they're having problems with anxiety or sleeping or ruminations or something like that along the way. And then it hit a point where it just tipped over the edge and they were no longer functional in their life. Um, <clears throat> so back to the original question, what are the symptoms and signs of mercury poisoning? They are rather defined. So um, what we see correlated with a mercury burden is anxiety, <clears throat> ruminations of a fight or flight type, and um, sleep problems. Now, when I say ruminations of a fight or flight type, these are sort of like where you're in that sympathetic overdrive where, am I going to die? Am I going to die? Um, <clears throat> is my family still love me? Um, things like that. There is a slight variation of of an OCD type that ruminates emotionally about emotional hurts and um, emotional losses and breakups and things like that. It's slightly different. This is an OCD um, that's sort of like a pre-panic uh, type of OCD. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, it generally presents as constant. So there are a lot of reasons why a person can have intermittent anxiety. It can be blood sugar, it can be hormonal, it can be interdosing withdrawal from taking a medication at night that doesn't have the staying power to last 24 hours. 
it can be um, situational anxiety, but that persistent sort of anxiety that feels like um, <clears throat> you're standing in the middle of a freeway, like there's a background roar in your nervous system and it might get better or worse, but it's always still there. That generally is speaking to some sort of neurotoxic poisoning. And when you've got that triad of symptoms with the ruminating OCD, um, the sleep problems and the anxiety, um, you start thinking mercury. And where do you get a mercury burden from? Um, that isn't one of the questions here, but I'll go into it anyway. Well, the primary source really is um, the dental fillings. Um, but it also can come from, from uh, food sources or from environmental sources. So there's a kind of a combination between your environment, whether it's in your teeth or food you're eating or your, or your, um, you know, your environment, like you're working in a place where it's just kind of laying around on the countertops or something. That's your exposure. Combine that with genetics, a certain genetic hand that is not able to really that transform. I mean, nobody really transforms mercury that well, as I, as I stated before, but there's some people that are really super impaired at it. You combine those two things together and you definitely have a problem. All right, next question. What is the proposed mechanism for mercury causing anxiety problems? Um, we believe, based upon certain notions we have about serotonin, that it's impairing the serotonin melatonin pathway. So serotonin is sort of that neurochemical that keeps you from, um, like you have the you have the the brain stem. It's a very reptilian type of architecture and cognitive ability, which means it doesn't really have any cognition. Um, it it basically is impulsive, and it knows kill, devour. Uh, in, in the realms of intimacy, it would just be like a lizard raping another lizard, you know? That's pretty much what the impulsive reptilian brain looks like. Well, we have an overlay of a, an emotional brain. So the neurochemicals that are involved here are different than the ones that are here. They're sort of like a counterbalance that suppresses these things neurochemically and modifies them into what we would consider to be human rational, you know, emotions. So instead of killing that person, we may find ourselves somewhat interested in how they're different than us and look for a level of diplomacy that causes us to be able to relate to each other and modifying those certain impulsive things. If there's a deficit there where you have a serotonin deficit, a person presents in a certain way. And the way that they present is, again, the same things. Serotonin makes melatonin, which is your sleep neurohormone, so you can't do that part, and you have a problem sleeping, especially staying asleep. Um, you have these impulsive things coming up all the time, and you don't have anything to buffer that and soften that. So that's how these people present. Um, there is another uh, mechanism I was reading in the literature that seemed to have a lot of supporting evidence behind it, and that is that um, mercury dysregulates glutamate the expression of glutamate. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Um, it is your primary, it's the primary neurotransmitter for your central nervous system in your brain uh, to cause some sort of exciting thing to happen for one neuron to talk to another. And um, it sort of dysregulates that where you get overstimulation. So it's a sort of, it's, it's a form of what we call excitotoxicity. And, um, Excess glutamate has also been implicated in uh, psychosis disorders. Uh, a lot of the drugs go after um, pulling back dopamine from people who have psychotic issues. But glutamate has also, excess glutamate has also been implicated in people that have um, mania and psychosis disorders. And truthfully, the mechanism, whether it's serotonin or glutamate, the, it, it's the same thing. If you're over ramping the stimulating side of things, it's really truthfully the same as not being able to inhibit stimulation. So um, those are the proposed mechanisms. <laughs> Next question, does mercury cause depression? Um, that's not my first choice when I see somebody depressed. Um, now, mercury is the most toxic, naturally occurring substance. The only two things that are more toxic are radioactive compounds that are man-made. 
And it's so toxic that if I have a thermometer and I want to mail it to my friend, I can't do it. I can't put it in the mail because the thing could explode and could with the pressurization and cause the toxicity in the postal service. But yet somehow it's okay to put this stuff in your head. And it's not just, I mean, what's really phenomenal about that is mercury disintegrates brain tissue. I mean, in the parts per million, really low, like two parts per million will destroy neurons on contact. And somehow, I mean, in medicine, honestly, there are a lot of foibles, a lot of them. And there's a lot of things that are not really talked about. They're just kind of hoping that they'll go away with the passage of time. The fact that the American Dental Association has not owned up to this is disgusting. It truly is disgusting. Putting mercury fillings in people's head was done because it was cheap, it was effective, the amalgam was really easy to work with, and that's it. It had nothing to do with whether it's safe for you or not. Um, but I don't, I don't, but could enough neurodegeneration in your brain in any place cause depression? Yeah, it could cause all sorts of things. If you start destroying brain tissue, especially around, you know, your um, pituitary gland and other endocrine gland glands, yes, you could cause anything that a brain lesion would produce, including depression. But it's not the first thing I think of when I see somebody depressed. Um, next question, can mercury fillings cause mental problems? I think we covered that. Um, certainly can cause cognition problems. We see cognition problems a lot with people. Um, and the aforementioned, um, you know, trio of symptoms. Uh, and what's really, um, what's really demonstrative is it just, it's just this grinding constant sort of anxiety. And, 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 and when you have constant anxiety, it doesn't necessarily always have to be mercury, but when you have that it's a neurotoxic profile when someone is constantly anxious. And um, there's other things like pesticides, especially organophosphates that can cause that. We have another video on neurotoxicity. If you want to know more about the type of neurotoxins, aside from mercury, that could be causing um, um, a constant anxiety. <clears throat> Last question is, how do you rid your body of mercury? Um you don't rid your body of mercury. You reduce the body burden to a point where you're no longer symptomatic. We use chelation. Um, the chelating agent is called DMPS, and that goes and scavenges for um, mercury ions and dumps it into your urine. <clears throat> it's not effective at crossing the blood-brain barrier. So um, when you get it out of your body, hopefully that is... A also allowing it your your natural systems to kind of transform it out of your out of your brain as well. But one of the things that um, even may precede a, a heavy metal burden is a person just is not mineralized enough. Our farming techniques um, have demineralized the soil. A can of spinach now, or you know, a spinach that is harvested now. Uh, compared to a can of spinach from the 30s, has 1 40th the amount of magnesium because of the overfarming of our soils. And this relates to all sorts of different um, trace minerals and minerals that we need in order to be able to do every enzymatic action, re reaction that we have. So you want to be able to flood the body with minerals because those minerals are kind of the natural um, mimic of the metals. So there's a molecular mimicry that happens where a, a tissue will look at a mercury the same way it might look at a cobalt or a molybdenum, let's say. So if you give the body enough of those trace minerals, it can kind of start to slowly let go of um, your, your metals as well. So you do the chelation and you do re remineralization in between the chelation. How do you do this at home if you don't have the ability to do... Um, uh, chelation or IVs uh, with antioxidants. You bone up on your antioxidants, including your coenzyme Q12, Q10, excuse me, your alpha lipoic acid, and vitamin C. Um, 
and work to uh, not uh, work to reduce your oxidative stress through antioxidants. And one of the main things is to get the mercury fillings out of your head. If you have mercury fillings, getting those things replaced by a green dentist, I think, is paramount. Um, that's literally the first step, especially if you've got the anxiety disposition that we talked about earlier. Um, eating fish that is not farm raised. If you're going to eat fish wild caught, um, but then limiting your wild caught to smaller fish varieties, topping out at about a salmon, you get bigger into the tuna and swordfish and you've got an older fish that accumulated a toxic burden that it is now imparting to you, which is the same reason why farm raised fish uh, there's toxic, you know, there's, there's small fish that they're grinding up and they're feeding it to the bigger fish and then taking even those same fish that didn't make it through, you know, the spawning process all the way to full maturity to sale and then grinding that up and they're amplifying, they're bioaccumulating in those fish ponds, um, toxicity. So the farm raised fish have that attribute to them, whereas the smaller and medium sized wild caught fish are considered safe. All right. Well, thank you for um, hanging with me on all these questions. I do appreciate getting this information out to you because I think it's very important and hope to see you on our next video and have a good day or night. <music>